Okay, welcome to class, everybody. Um, just a couple quick announcements before we dive into our learning objectives for today. On Friday is our first midterm. Um, for those that are doing civil, there's 10 or 12 of you, that's your only midterm. The next midterm is your final. Um, uh, a note or two on the midterms, they, uh, I always grade them and then I apply a curve until the average test score is 80%, right? So I curve it up to an 80%. Um, what else can I say about them? There's, for most of you, you're gonna have three midterms and a final. And I don't drop a lowest test, but I do encourage people that had a bad test as a way to, to overcome it. I make it, um, here's what I do. Of the three midterms, I weight your worst one by 25% of its worth, and your best one by 175%, and your middle one just regular weight. Does that make sense? So it's not the same as dropping it, but it means if you had a really bad day and then you just do awesome on one of your other midterms, it, almost, it has a very similar effect to almost dropping that, that low score. So if you, if you whiff it this Friday, I try to, try to not whiff it, but if you do, it's not the end of the world, okay? What can you bring? You can bring one sheet of paper front and back with notes written on it. The reason I do this is really in your best interest. If I just let you bring your notes, I promise you'd spend the whole time flipping through your notes trying to find the right equation. And these tests are notoriously difficult to finish on time. Even though we try and engineer them to be the right length, you're going to want all the, all the time you have. And so taking the time to put the most important notes on your test sheet will save you time. So go ahead and do that. Um, you can bring a ruler. You cannot bring a phone or a, cal or, a, uh, or a computer. You can use a calculator. You can use a periodic table. It doesn't have to be the one I gave you. You can use another one if you'd like. Um, all the work that you do will be done in a blue book that we will provide. So if you want to bring extra scratch paper, you can, but the only thing that we're going to grade is the stuff that's in the blue book. Okay? What else can I say? Um, are there other questions? Oh, how about this? When you do your work, you need to do it in a pen, something non-erasable if you want it to have a potential regrade. If you think that we messed up the grading on it, we won't regrade something that was written in pencil. So I suggest bring a pen. You can just scribble it out if it was a part that you wanted to, to disregard, then you can do that pretty easily. But if you want us to regrade it, then it has to be in pen. Other questions about the midterm this Friday? It's in this room. All the TAs will be here to proctor it. It'll go exactly from 12.55 to 1.45, and then we'll stop. There will be assigned seating, which will be projected on the board as you're coming in. We'll help people get seated in their spots, and then we'll start right on time. So if you can get here a little bit early on Friday, great, and we'll be leaving right at the end of class. Okay. Today, what do we have left to learn? The last bit, which we will be testing on, is really just two objectives, and then if we have time, we might jump to the next chapter. The two objectives left in this chapter that we haven't gotten to yet is ternary phase diagrams and then the steel phase diagram. We'll talk a little bit more about drawing microstructures, but those are the two main things we need to cover today. So let's dive right into the ternary phase diagram. Okay, a ternary phase diagram, as the name suggests, it's no longer a binary or a unary where there's one or two components. Now you can have three, right? And you could have even more. It's not like only three, three element compounds e exist four, five, even more actually exist, right? Um, they get complicated to represent what phases are found at what temperatures and pressures. Because look at this, to represent three different components, just call it A, B, and C, that might be like silicon, aluminum, and zinc, right? Something like that. To just represent those three and to show them as a function of temperature, we have to have a three-dimensional object that shows it, right? If we wanted to include pressure, we'd have to have a four-dimensional object, which makes our brains hurt, right? So these get really hard to picture. Even a three-dimensional one's hard to work with because what this really is is a series of surfaces, right? If you could imagine this, this object, there's like surfaces that you're running up and down. So what they do is they put these sort of topographical lines, except that in topographical lines on maps, those represent elevation. Here, those represent temperature because in the elevation direction, it's temperature, right? It's not height, it's, it's temperature. Nevertheless, these are useful and we can learn a lot from them. You could say, okay, pure A melts at this temperature, pure B is here, pure C is here. But when you mix things together, as is often but not always the case, when you mix them, the melting point goes down. Many, many compounds have a eutectic reaction. We know that eutectic is when these things 
come in, like steel right here, right? This is, we're going to look at steel in just a moment. Steel, from pure iron all the way over to pure carbon, there's this eutectic right here. It lowered the melting point. The same thing's happening there in our ternary phase diagram. And if you go, like, take, take the mixture of A and C. Ignore B for a minute. So we're just looking at this white region right here. Just that white region, that looks like a regular eutectic. In fact, it's a, yeah, it's our binary eutectic. Um, but then if you include B, it typically lowers the melting point even further, right? So this melting point would be, you know, this looks like it's about 700, that dotted line, the dashed line here. But if you look at this one, it actually goes below 700. It might be almost to 600, right? This is generally the case that the more elements you mix in, often it's the case that the lower it goes. Not always. There's definitely exceptions. Just like with binary diagrams, there's exceptions as well, right? You could have a eutectic over here, a eutectic over here. But overall, this thing is at a high melting point in the middle, right? The same thing can happen with ternary phase diagrams. Ternary phase diagrams get tricky to talk about and to work with, and we're not going to do so in this class, so don't sweat it. I'm just telling you that they exist um, and that there's ways of making them easier to understand. One of the ways to do so is to take a cross-section at a specific temperature, right? If you do that, and he's going to get real nasty, right? So take uh, this one, right? So this is a mixture of three ceramic compounds. They've left out the names here, but this is right. So forced right, that's FO, uh, anorthite, and diopside. Those are mineral names. They're just, think of them as ceramic compounds, right? At a specific, so this is actually showing the three-dimensional. Sorry, this is looking at it with the topographical lines. Some of them will do it at a specific temperature, like right here, and it gets real nasty, right? This is taken at a specific temperature, which uh, I don't know where it's shown. Yeah, at 600 Celsius. This is aluminum iron silicon system. Um, it gets really busy, right? So there's ways to read these. Um, we're not going to do it in this class. I'll just say that it's out there. If you guys in your research or in your work encounter them, you want to learn more about them, come contact me. But I, we're not going to cover them in this class. Okay? That said, let's move on to the steel phase diagram. The steel phase diagram is so important, you should almost just memorize it, right? You should memorize where these key points are at. What are the key points? Things like, what's the eutectoid temperature? 727. What is the maximum solid solubility of carbon in the ferrite phase? 0.022. What is the composition of cementite? 6.7. What's the eutectoid composition? 0 0.76. At least those things you should just know, right? Those four bits of information. The rest of the diagram is important, but less so. Those four things are critical because steel um, there's a gazillion different types of steel, right? There's just so many different types that we need a way to um, talk about them easily and quickly. And knowing this phase diagram will help. So let's dive into this. What does this phase diagram have, right? At first glance, let's make it a little bigger. What's going on here? Um, so first off, it's only going from pure iron over here. And at the far right, rather than going to 100% carbon, it's only going out to 6.7 weight percent carbon. So this is actually a very, very small portion of the, of the whole phase diagram because this is where the important steel and, and other uh, steel-related compounds exist. The things that have much more carbon in them, we don't use as steel. They're, they're, they're not as technologically useful. They might be useful for other things, but they're not in the same family as steel. Um, that said, we can start uh, picking out important reactions. I've already mentioned that there is a eutectic. I think that this should work fine to draw on it now. I think I've corrected it. Um, there's a eutectic reaction. Above it, you've got a liquid. Below it, you've got a mixture of two phases. You've got austenite, that's the gamma phase, and cementite, that's Fe3C. They call it cementite, or iron carbide, because it's a ceramic. By the time you add that much uh, carbon to the iron, it's no longer like pure iron over here, which is metallic bonding. When you mix iron and carbon, you now start to get a mixture of ionic and covalent bonding which makes it behave much more like a ceramic. So it's much more brittle. It's, a, it's, it, it's very hard. It's stiff, this material. And that's why they call it cementite, because it's, it's starting to act a bit like cement, right? Austenite, I don't know why they call it that. There's probably a reason. But the gamma phase is called austenite. It's a term you should get familiar with. Um, so that's the eutectic. What else do we have? What other reactions do you guys see? <laughs> 
Maybe turn to a neighbor and tell your neighbor what you see. What do you see, Bell? What, what reactions do you see? Yeah, so there's clearly a eutectic at 4.3. What else is there? At the very, yeah, 4.3, that's the dot, that's the eutectic. Are there other important reactions here? Right, that's the eutectic. But let me ask you this. Those two points, up high and down low, what do those correspond to? Paratectic is up top. You've got a liquid and delta. Solid, which is called what? What do we call that? You want to write? Yeah, you tectoid. Yeah. Okay, what do we got? I, I've put two new blue dots up here. What are they? Who's feeling brave? Which one's a paratectic? The uh, up top? That's right, because above it, you've got a mixture of liquid plus, they've written delta, if you can read that. So that's a paratectic because it's liquid plus delta turning into austenite, gamma. Okay, that's a paratectic. What else? What's this one? This is a eutectoid, right? Eutectic is a liquid going to two solids. Eutectoid is solid going to two different solids. Okay? So those are the key reactions taking place in this thing. Now, in this phase diagram, iron, when we talk about pure iron, we're really saying iron plus up to a small amount of of carbon, like 008 weight percent. Anything less than 008 weight percent, we typically just call iron. We don't call it a steel. Once you start adding more than 0 0.008 weight percent, all the way up to around 2.4, which is right around here, this region is kind of our steel region, right? So all the different types of steel you hear about, most of them lie in that region. We're going we're gonna to parse that up a little bit further in a second. And then there's cast irons, which are essentially all of that region. So like your cast irons, like Dutch oven or stove, though you know those things are brittle because if you've ever dropped one, you saw it crack and break. It's because they have much, much more cementite in them than the ductile metal, right? Um, we can classify these a little bit better, though. The AISC, it's one of the associations for uh, in material science and metallurgy. They've provided the following classifications. You've got low carbon steel, and you've probably heard these terms before, like medium carbon steel, high carbon steel. It's talking about how much carbon, right, is in this phase diagram. So if you're between 0.05 weight percent and 0.3, so up to about, you know, basically that range right there, or thereabouts, that's your low carbon steel. And what can we say about low carbon steel? We know that sometimes we'll call it mild steel. First off, it's cheap, and it's easy to shape, right? The reason it's easy to shape is because as the phase diagram suggests, if you cool wherever you start over here, when you cool it down to this region, you've now got a mixture of alpha plus cementite, ferrite plus cementite. And the cementite's the brittle stuff, the ferrite's the ductile stuff, so it's not surprising that this region's going to be much more ductile. Okay? Now, there's a lot more to steel. It happens to really matter a lot how quickly you cross that eutectoid reaction. We're going to come back to this in chapter 11 when we talk about kinetics. So hold your thought. Like not all low carbon steels are the same. They can be very, very different depending on how you quench them from high temperatures. Okay. Uh, then you've got your medium carbon steels from 0.3 up to 0.8. So just above the eutectoid um, composition at 0.76. That's your medium carbon steel. And you start to see a trade-off. By moving towards more and more carbon, you're starting to form a higher phase fraction of your brittle phase, right? So these have kind of a mixture of ductility and strength. The, the cementite is very strong compared to pure ferrite, which is ductile and weak. So you're getting kind of the best of both worlds in these medium carbon steels. Um, they have pretty good wear properties from the increased amount of cementite present. So they're, they're kind of a, a compromise. As you move towards high carbon steel and ultra high carbon steel, right? high carbon they're calling 
basically this range. That's high carbon for them. And then ultra high carbon is all the way to these ones, what we were calling cast irons before. Those things, you really start to sacrifice ductility and toughness to get much higher strength. So you, you use these things, but you need to think about the right scenario for using them. You would never use these in a high impact application, right? For example, you wouldn't want um, the axle of your car made out of this, because if you hit a big pothole, that impact might be enough to fracture it, right? Because these don't have what we call fracture toughness, which we will talk all about next chapter, right? Um, but they, because they are so high in the cementite phase, they can become very strong, not tough, but strong, right? And very hard. So you can make uh, tool dies out of them. So if you wanted to like make a die that you're pressing things in, and you don't want the die to get scratched and dent by pressing, you make it out of a high carbon steel or a tool steel. It's going to be something that's high carbon. Okay. We will talk more about these a little bit later on when, we talk, when we've introduced kinetics, because then we'll talk about how you quench them to, to modify these further. But for now, realize that these are some of the general classifications you might hear. Low carbon, medium carbon, high carbon. Now, this assumes that the only two things in the steel right now is iron and carbon. And you know that's not the case. If you ever look up like the, what's the composition of steels, very often there's a significant amount of chromium. I think we talked about this earlier in the semester. Why do they add chromium? Anybody remember? Did we talk about this? Let me tell you this. When you add chromium over about 13%, atomic percent, you create, I think it's atomic percent, you create stainless steel. What do you think the chromium is doing? Turn to your neighbor and discuss. What do you think is happening? Hi. What do you guys think? Stainless steel. What's chromium doing there? What is stainless steel? Ah, your first one's correct. The chromium acts a lot like aluminum in that it forms chromium oxide. Just like aluminum oxide is a passivating layer, chromium is doing the same exact thing. And so it still can corrode, but it's way slower because it has that protective layer. Okay, chromium in steel makes it stainless. What's happening there? Somebody have a thought? Somebody want to say what your neighbor said if you don't have a thought? Ashton, what, what happened? What do you think? Think of it the exact same way as aluminum oxide on aluminum protects it from further oxidation because it forms that passivating layer. By adding a significant amount of chromium, you actually form a layer of chromium oxide on the surface that passivates it from further rust formation, oxidation, right? So these things still can rust. Um, it's stainless, not stain proof, right? They, they will stain over time, they will corrode, but it's much slower, right? So it's a, it's a pretty great material. And so that's just chromium, but you can add other things. You can add manganese, you can add molybdenum, you can add all sorts of, you know, bat's wings and stuff into these things to make them the specific type of steel that you're looking for. And there's lots of custom steels that people will try and sell you that they claim will have certain properties. Some of them really are unique, say Inconel. Inconel steel, they use for extremely high temperature applications, like really high temperatures. I think you go up to like 12 or 1300 C without it corroding, which is pretty amazing when it comes to steel. Um, so there's some specialty steels, but a lot of them, I don't know if, I, there's just a lot of, there, it's, it's all just to trade off between strength and ductility for the most part. But there are a few that provide specialty functions, okay? Um, because you have this eutectoid temperature, we have this really, really important eutectoid reaction. Anywhere along this line, anywhere along here, if you cross that line, then you have, eutect you have the eutectoid reaction, which is austenite forming ferrite plus cementite, Fe3C. Anywhere along there. Now, if you cross it exactly at the eutectoid composition, then you get 100% of your austenite to transform all at once. And that's when you get nothing but a lamellar structure. If you're to the left or to the right, we've been talking about this, you're going to form what's called a pro-eutectoid phase. By the way, on the, on the reading quiz, the TA had written that wrong. She called it pro-eutectic or something. So I've corrected that reading question from this week to be participation only. Basically, if you cross to the left or the right, 
the second you cross that red line and you start to form cementite, well, cementite, that's one of your eutectoid react, uh, products. So that's your pro-eutectoid phase that's forming. Over here, the same thing. As soon as you cross that line, you start to form alpha, and that's one of your eutectoid products. So that's a pro-eutectoid phase. Okay? Now, how do we draw the microstructures of these things is, is important because we're going to have to draw microstructures all semester long. So let's go ahead and do so. Let's draw it for this one right here. If you were to draw that thing, let's say draw it at this point. Well, let's do it right above the eutectoid and right below. Right? So maybe turn to a neighbor and take a stab at drawing this, and then we'll see what you guys get. Right above and right below the eutectoid. Okay, does anybody feel brave? They want to come draw this? Somebody dare to draw this for us? Nobody dares? Nobody at all? All right, let's draw this first one together. So let's draw just above the eutectic, or eutectoid, and just below the eutectoid, right? So if, I, if this was on a test and I asked you to label the phase fraction and composition, that means that you'd actually have to do the lever rule, which means you'd have to figure out what's our initial composition. And if I didn't tell you and you're reading it off of this, it looks to me like it's something like 1.4, maybe? Right? That looks about like 1.4. So if we did the lever rule just above and we want to figure out what's the fraction of our two phases, the phase we're talking about is gamma plus cementite. And let's do the weight fraction. The weight fraction of gamma is going to be the, the longer section of the line from 6.7 to our 1.4 divided by the total length, right? So that's going to be 6.7 minus 1.4 divided by 6.7 minus 0 0.76. 0 0.76 is the eutectoid composition. That's why you want to remember these, these numbers because you're going to use them a lot, right? When you punch that in, we get... you get n almost 90%, 89%. So you have 89 weight percent austenite. So even though you're just above that eutectoid reaction, you're still, the vast majority is still austenite in this case because we're so close to that eutectoid composition, which means we're close to the austenite phase boundary, right? So if I was going to draw this thing, it initially started out as just grains, right? Up here, if we were going to draw it, it would just be grains of austenite. So the grains of austenite are still kind of there, but what do we now do to modify this thing? We now need to add about 10 weight percent of cementite. Where will it choose to be? Yeah, if you came to the review session last night, um, then you know this. By the way, if you didn't come to the review session, I strongly suggest you watch the YouTube video on it. If you can't find that, send me an email. I'll send you a direct link to it, but it's on the class playlist. We talked about this, but along with the rest of the test. But it, we, we decided that it's going to form along the grain boundaries, right? So if I was going to draw this, let's say that the cementite phase is black. It's going to form where the old grain boundaries were. Somebody help me understand what's the rationale for this. Why will it form on the grain boundaries as opposed to, say, precipitating in the middle of the structure? Yeah, remind me your name in the red. Harley. Harley. Why does it do it? Yeah. Surface, the reason that the word surface energy, you guys have probably heard that before, surfaces cost energy. And in this class, when we talk about energy, it's either entropy or enthalpy, 
The reason that surfaces cost, en uh, cost energy is due to enthalpy. It has to do with bonding, right? So again, think of these, if these are atoms up here, most of the people in this room are surrounded by, let's say, four people, if, it's like a, if all the seats were occupied. Then the people on the front, they only have people on either side and behind them. So they have three bonds, but they're missing a bond out here. So that's costing them enthalpy. There's an energy penalty for Avery, who's sitting on this boundary. So we don't want to sit on these boundaries, or we want as few of these boundaries as possible from an enthalpy standpoint. That make sense? So basically, if I, if I ask you which one's going to create more surface area, um, which of these two creates more surface area, right? This was from the review session as well, right? Let's say you're at this composition. You cool it down, and now you're in the pure alpha region. So it's just 100% alpha. But you cross over this line, and now you're going to start to form the epsilon phase, or the theta phase, I guess they're calling it, right? Theta. So where will theta form? It can either do this and precipitate out in tiny regions in the middle of your grains, or it, they can all travel to the grain boundaries and do this. This one has much less surface area than this one. There's fewer interfaces between those two different phases here than there are there. So this is energetically favorable, and this one is not, right? Now, they write ideal versus typical for a different reason. It has to do with the strengthening of these things, which we'll talk about in a couple chapters. Um, so how do you know which one of these two will happen? This one's supposed to happen. But if you're doing this at a low temperature, what you're really relying on is, take a look at this. The, the theta phase that forms is clear over here. It's 50-50, essentially, whereas alpha is almost 100% aluminum. So you're relying on this new theta phase, which is shown in white here. That's a mixture of copper and aluminum. So all the copper that had been sort of randomly mixed here has to diffuse to these grain boundaries in order to get this result, and that takes time and temperature. If your materials don't diffuse quickly, or if you don't give it the time or the temperature for them to do so, then you're going to be stuck with this. Maybe that's desirable for your application, right? But that's, both of these can happen. It just depends on how quickly your atoms can move. So I won't mark one wrong or the other yet in this class, because we haven't learned some of these details yet but both of those are possible scenarios. This one is the favorable one for sure, but it might be too slow to achieve it, right? Because you might be at a low temperature. Josh, did you have it? Yeah, so if you cooled this really quickly, you might prevent these things from segregating at all. You might cool it down so fast that you take away all the thermal energy that these things needed to hop around and to clump together, right, to form these white spots. So you might not see any precipitates form. And if you cool it down at an intermediate speed, you might get this. And if you cool it down really slowly, you might get that. It all, it's all a function of temperature, right? This is happening at 500 C. In the world of material science, that's a, a pretty low temperature. That's not a lot of thermal energy. Most things don't really start moving much until higher than that. Okay? It, but it all depends. Okay? Any questions about that? So again, we know that these things are going to form just above this eutectoid reaction along the grain boundaries. And then as soon as we cross below the grain boundary, we could do our lever rule calculation again, right? Let's give ourselves some room. Just below, so this is at T above eutectoid and at T below the eutectoid. Now we could do our lever rule again and figure out how much um, cementite do we have? What's our weight fraction of cementite, Fe3C? That now, cementite is on the right-hand side. So when we do the lever rule, we want to take the left-hand side chunk. So that's going to be 1.4 minus, not 0.76 anymore. Now it's going to go all the way over to 0.022, which is why you want to memorize that number. Right? So this is going to be 1.4 minus 0.022. This is all going to be divided by 6.7 minus 0.022. Right? And it's going to be some number. You're going to have the grain boundaries left over from before for the most part, but now you're going to have the eutectic structure everywhere else. Any questions on this? This was on the homework, so I'm guessing people already feel pretty good about this. Okay. Can I clarify anything on this? Yeah. Yeah. Now that we're below that line, we're in a different phase field, and that phase field goes all the way over to 0.022, just below the eutectoid 
temperature. Okay. If we were going to do this on the left-hand side, in our to the left of the eutectoid, by the way, to the left of the eutectoid, we call that hypo-eutectoid. To the right, we call these hyper-eutectoid. I think we talked about that. Was it last class or was it in the, the study session? All right, let me just make it clear. Um, Hypo-eutectoid compositions are composition less than 0 0.76 weight percent carbon, which is the eutectoid composition. And hyper-eutectoid eutectoid compositions are compositions that are greater than 0 0.76 weight percent carbon. Okay. Can I clarify this at all? Because we're basically done with this chapter, if so. Yeah, Josh? Well, OK, let's go back up to this example we were just at. As you start to cool this thing down through this two-phase region, the gamma composition does not stay the same. Cementite does. Cementite stays the same. As you cool it down, cementite is a line compound, so its composition doesn't change as you cool down. But as you're cooling down over here, your austenite is changing composition. It's surrendering carbon atoms so that you can crystallize more and more cementite, which needs those carbon atoms. So it's changing composition by following this line. At any temperature, you could draw a flat line, and where it intersects the two ends, that's the composition of those two phases. So you can see that it's changing here. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Other things I can answer? Yeah, Julia? At the eutectic point, how would this look different? Well, at the eutectic eutectoid point, yeah, at the eutectoid point, you wouldn't have formed any of the pro-eutectoid phase along the grain boundaries. So that dark region along the grain boundaries, you wouldn't draw that there. Instead, you would draw, if we were right below it, say, that would just look like, there would be sort of like grains and regions, but they wouldn't have that big dark region that had previously been the grain boundaries. Those won't be there anymore. We will come back to steel later. The thickness of these lamellar structures um, really, really strongly influences the mechanical properties. If they're really close together and they're very thin, you get really high hardness and low ductility. If they're really thick and coarse, then you get a much more ductile steel. So even though you can change the ductility versus strength with the iron composition, iron and carbon composition, you can also change it with how you micro, you engineer the microstructure, which is the thickness of these layers, right? And we give those different names. So I think it actually talks a little bit about it. Um, there's, there's perlite, right? But there's also bainite and these, and these other ones, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on the semester. Okay? That is it. Anything else I can answer about phase diagrams before we move on? This is your last chance to ask new questions before we leave the material that we're going to be covering on the test. Okay. Let's move on then. Um, I'm going to start chapter 9 today. We're only going to get a little bit in. I'm gone all week next week, um, so I'm going to pre-record my lectures. The TAs are going to come and hit play. They're going to do the top hat quizzes. Uh, they will pause, and when I get to a question, they will like teach stuff. In the past, this has worked pretty well. Um, I think it will work really well again. They're going to do awesome demos. The lecture stuff will be provided, so you still need to come to class if you want to get your in-class participation points. You'll just see me talking from Poland, <laughs> okay? So that'll be happening next week. But there is still class, so come. Okay, so the next chapter that we choose to, again, we're kind of going out of order in the book, but don't sweat it. Um, the next chapter is on failure, right? <laughs> yeah, failure. Um, and you know, up until now, We've been doing a lot of stuff that the chemist in me is like super jazzed about. It's all applied. It's like, we're using chemistry. All that stuff we learned, there's a purpose for it, and it relates to engineering materials. And mechanical engineers are like, mm. But now, now we're talking about mechanical properties and fracture. It, now you guys are going to love this, right? And we're not even, like, there's more chapters on mechanical properties. This is just the first one. This one's just about fracture, failure, right? So here's our objectives. And I don't know how far we'll get today because we're sort of halfway through the class, but the first thing I want to differentiate between is ductile versus brittle fracture. 
And there's going to be an awesome demo on this on Monday, so you don't want to miss Monday. Um, we're then going to use what's called fractography, which is looking at a fracture surface under a, a microscope, to differentiate whether it was brittle or ductile fracture. We're going to talk about what are stress concentrators and why do these lead to failure. And we might introduce, yeah, we'll probably have time to introduce the stress intensity factor and the concept of fracture toughness. And I don't think we'll get further than that. Now, I, a quick announcement that some of the stuff they've taken out of the book as they go from different editions. And sadly, they took out the Paris law for fatigue failure, which is like one of like the classic things about fracture. And I cannot believe they took it out. So I've added a small additional reading on Canvas. So if you go to files, additional reading, there's from another book, there's a, a, a small section that covers it. It's a couple pages. You're going to want to read that for the homework that'll be due long after. So the next homework, you just turned in this one. The next one's not due in a week from today. It's in two weeks. So don't worry about doing the homework. Just focus on studying for the midterm. But when the other one does come due, you'll want to use these additional readings. Okay. All right. <clears throat> failure. Failure is typically an undesirable phenomenon when it comes to engineering. Is that always the case? Do we sometimes design things to fail? Maybe turn to a neighbor and talk about an instance where you think something might be designed to fail. That's its purpose. What do you guys think? When are things supposed to fail? I don't know, but like, I know what she means, but I can't think of any examples. But no examples come to mind. Sometimes when like, cars crash, they kind of like explode. Yeah, you want some things to buckle, which is fracturing sometimes, but to do so in a certain way. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. So if it is going to fracture, you want to control the way it fractures. Uh, typically, you want to increase the time so it reduces the, mom the momentum transfer, the impact. OK, anybody have something? When do we design something as engineers where failure is actually a good thing? That means it's doing its job is when something fails. And again, failure we're talking about as the separation of a body into two or more pieces, right? A fracture is, it's fracturing, it's breaking. Avery, what's going on? Ah, electrical fuse is a really great um, guess. That typically, I mean, it doesn't break due to mechanical stresses. That's the catch. That thing is supposed to break, but it doesn't break due to mechanical stresses. It, does to, it melts, basically. When too large of a current goes through it, it melts and separates. But that's a really good first guess. Uh, run me your name. Nick. Yeah, we were talking about that up front. Um, a car, you want it to compress and buckle. Buckling's not the same as fracturing, because it's still one piece, it's just bending. But you're definitely wanting it to bend in a certain way, so you don't smash the people inside like right, grapes or something. So what about something that breaks? Any ideas? Over there. <laughs> I, I think you're a pessimist, but you're a realist, because I bet <laughs> I guarantee that you know, designing failure into things is something engineers do. Um, I don't think that's a great practice. I, like, I have ethical qualms about designing things to fail after x number of uses, but can you do it? And is that its purpose? Absolutely. What else? Yeah. Uh, and Toyota car locks, they like, fail, so you can't pick them. So you have to get a new lock. Oh, interesting. So if you're trying to like, slim jim it in the window or something, it it'll just break. Oh, really? That's fascinating. That sounds like a great homework question. So that's a, that's a cool one. I've never heard of that. So I'm going to learn more about it and probably write a question about it. That's cool. Uh, Harley, what else? That's, that's a huge one. Inside any pressure vessel, almost any pressure vessel, it has a pressure release valve. How does that work? It's a piece of metal oftentimes that shears, shear meaning like it's a so you guys probably know about shear. But if I push straight down on this table, I'm applying my stress. Again, stress is force over the area. I'm applying it. I'm applying it normal to the surface. If I instead push this like that, I'm applying a shear stress because a component of my stress is parallel to the surface. 
So that's a shear. And th they designed these pins such, such that a shear stress from the pressure of the gas or the liquid inside of these things actually bends the valve, and all of a sudden it can release. So pressure release valves, these things are designed to fail at a very specific, uh, under very specific mechanical conditions. So yeah, that's, that's one I was thinking of. There's probably others. Anybody have an awesome one they wanted to say? There's probably other ones. In the way back, is it Roar? Bryce? Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> On what part of the airplane is this? Um, on the tow bar. Oh, interesting. So yeah, okay, so it's like kind of like a cotter pin then, and that thing breaks instead of more, more expensive stuff? Interesting, yeah. Okay, when things do, well, so, so first of all, I'll just say like, typically failure is undesired, obviously. You don't typically want our things to break. Um, but it's gonna happen, right? Things break all the time. And so what we, we really would like is a way to plan for it, and learn from it, right? And then maybe alter the way that we made the material or used the material or chose the material in the first place to get a better outcome, whether that was failure or not, right? So let's dive into fracture a little bit. Fracture is the separation of a component into two or more pieces due to some stress, okay? That can be thermal stresses or it can be mechanical stresses, right? But it stresses, right? Now you've got two different sort of modes. Uh, well, modes is maybe the wrong word. There's two general types or classes ductile and brittle. And you've probably, you, you've experienced these, right? Something that fails in a ductile manner. If you've ever had a, a dish or a glass at home that you dropped on the floor and it explodes into a gazillion different pieces, you experienced ductile fracture firsthand, right? Brittle fracture is much different. Brittle fracture involves deformation first, um, right? So all of these, both types include both crack initiation and crack propagation. So you start out with a, a material that has no crack, which is the start of the separation, right? But a crack has to initially form, and then you have to have something for that crack to keep on growing until it reaches the end of the material, and now it's split the two, right? And both different types have this happen. The key difference is that in ductile fracture, that propagation is not spontaneous. That's the key thing. It's not spontaneous. Spontaneous means it's going to happen on its own once it gets past a certain point. In a, in a uh, brittle material, that crack propagation is spontaneous, right? If it's not spontaneous, then it's proceeding slowly, maybe even in a stable way, that allows us to monitor the crack growth over time, and then it might reach a point where it gets too big and it fails in a brittle way. So you can actually have both. You can have it start out ductile failure, and then after a certain point it can fail brittly, right? So this is crack growth, okay? All right, so <clears throat> Obviously, if one is spontaneous and you can't control for it, it just happens all of a sudden, that's less desirable than the one that you can observe the crack growing. So brittle fracture is generally less desirable, and it's harder to work around than ductile. They also look a little bit different, right? So if these were three different samples, and these all broke under slightly different ways, the one on the left over here, you've got this one here, and you've got that one, right? Take a look at the deformation that had to occur in these three different scenarios. In this one, it sort of, it, it bent inward. That deformation is called necking. We're going to talk more about it later on. Necking is when it, that deformation occurs. That's definitely a sign of ductile fracture. This one, some necking occurred, and then it was brittle fracture. And this one, there was very little warning. All of a sudden, a crack just propagated across it, uh, orthogonal to the loading direction. So that, that would be our, our brittle fracture. So it can be a mixture of these things. When it's that middle one, they call it cup and cone, right? Because this is sort of like a cone shape and this is sort of a cup shape that fits into it. So that is, a, it's more of a hallmark of brittle fracture than ductile. Whereas this is like straight brittle fracture. This thing, um, a crack was right here, it looks like. There's a little surface flaw that when you loaded this thing, this must have been the biggest flaw, the biggest what we're going to call a stress concentrator. And then that thing just cracked immediately without giving you much warning, right? Unless you could monitor this flaw ahead of time, which is we designed tools to try and do that, okay? All right. If you were to zoom in on these things with some sort of microscope, you can now enjoy the field of fractography. You are now a fractographer. If you're looking at the fracture surface, you're now a fractographer, right? So what are you looking for? Um, a couple things. Um, if it's a brittle fracture, since it's going to break mostly just right across without deformation, you're going to see a more smooth fracture surface. 
Whereas if it's a ductile one, the grains of the material might be able to rotate or move. The crack might be going around them or something. So it's a much rougher surface that might have little voids or pockets in it. So looking at the fractured surface, right away you can tell whether it was brittle or ductile. Anybody broken a piece of glass before and looked at the fractured surface? What's it look like? <clears throat> Looks something like this. So what do you see here? You see, this is where you, drop, you ever dropped your phone. There's like the point where it clearly hit the, 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 the floor, right? And then a bunch of lines extending outwards. Sometimes they're sort of V lines that point back to the initial surface. But the rest of it is pretty darn smooth. This is a smooth fracture surface. The crack started here and it propagated so rapidly through your material that it creates a very smooth flat surface, right? If you zoom in on it with a nice microscope, you'll typically see uh, images that look something like this. You see the initial flaw maybe that was present. Maybe this was like a pore on the surface or a speck of dust that got included in the glass or something. You see what's called the mirror region, which is very, very flat. You see the hackle or the mist, sorry, the mist regions right here, excuse me. And then this is the hackle region is what they call these different things. Um, very, very typical that you'll see these right here. You've got your initial flaw. This is clearly the onset of the hackle region, the mist, and this is kind of the, the uh, mirror region in the middle. So you can look at these things and you can often fortuitously find what your initial flaw was. So if you get a job at some company in the valley making something that is prone to brittle fracture, which I hate to tell you is a lot of things, even metals, a lot of them can break in a brittle way. You could zoom in on it in a microscope and you could say, what is that, right? What's happening there that caused this thing to break? And if you're a good engineer, you'll start to pull all the things out of your toolkit that you've been learning in college, like EDS, like we learned on the very first day of class. Somebody remind me, what is EDS? What might it do for us here? I'll, I'll give you a hint. EDS stands for Energy Dispersive Spectroscopy. What did it do for us? We call it EDX, EDAX, EDS, it's all the same thing. It tells you what atoms are there, right? So let's say you're making a steel, right? Then you expect to see iron, carbon, maybe chromium, whatever's in your mix. If you see something else right here, if you see silicon and oxygen, that's sand. Then you can say, somehow sand got in my process, embedded in my material, and provided a spot which must be what's called a stress concentrator. It takes the normal stress that your, that your part is being subjected to, and it amplifies the stress in the region around that flaw, right? Stress concentrator. It concentrates or it magnifies the stress. So if I take, um, if I take this stapler, right? If I pull on it, it's under more or less uniform stress across this top bar. But if there's a flaw deep inside of here, there's like a pore or a speck of something else that got cast inside of it, in the vicinity of that flaw, it's actually experiencing a much higher stress. And that could be the thing that will make it break. Very rarely do things not break without a flaw. If they do, then it's ductile failure, right? But if it's brittle failure, there's usually a flaw to be found. So you can play a bit of detective work and figure out, all right, where in my process could sand be getting introduced, right? And you start tracing the steps back, you start looking at all sorts of stuff. And this sounds like, like yeah, right, this isn't really happening, but like, this happens. In, uh, in semiconductor fab, eyelashes or eyebrows that have fallen out have caused failure and they've found them afterwards sort of thing. So. One of the guys from our department who I took classes with, now he's a, a manager at uh, I Am Flash, he related, this is amazing, the lake effect that we get here, is have smelt the lake effect when the whole valley sm smells a little bit like a fart, right? That's a little <laughs> bit of sulfur in the air. They related that to a little bit of sulfur forming an impurity on their semiconductor wafers, and they found out that on the days where there was lake effect, they were getting a higher fraction of failure, right? So this sounds kooky, but this is exactly the sort of detective work which will get you a big bonus when you figure out what's going wrong when everyone else is saying, I don't know. We just have to deal with like 80% yield. We're never going to do better than that. We will pick up here next time. I, I won't be here, but you guys need to be here.